Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Easy Conversations podcast, a podcast about having easy conversations. I'm your host, Burkan Dandia. In this week's episode, I bring on Dr. Stephen Poulter. Dr. Poulter is a renowned Los Angeles-based clinical psychologist in private practice with over 30 years experience. He brings a unique perspective to his practice and writings as a former law enforcement officer, seminary graduate, and ordained minister. Dr. Poulter has authored seven books, such as The Shame Factor, The Father Factor, The Mother Factor, Your Ex Factor, The Art of Successful Failure, and Father Your Son. His professional directive is always to help diagnosis, treat, and understand the power of our relationship world. His newest book, The Shame Factor, is a culmination of over 20,000 hours of in-person clinical experience addressing the insidious nature of shame. Dr. Poulter works with a wide range of people along with specializing in the father-son, father-daughter relationships and our relationship to psychology and spirituality. Dr. Poulter is married and the father of four children. In this episode, Dr. Poulter and I discuss the beginnings of shame and how shame impacts men in their lives. Dr. Poulter explains how he addresses shame in the various chapters of his book, The Shame Factor. We also discuss some of the ways we can normalize conversations around shame. Please find Dr. Poulter on Instagram at Dr. Stephen underscore Poulter underscore. And please leave a five-star review at the end of the episode. I would truly appreciate it. All right, Dr. Stephen Poulter, uh, welcome to the Easy Conversations podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm really excited for our conversation, and I'm super grateful for you to take the time and Aaron and, and have this conversation with me. But before we get started, I want to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself and, and tell the listeners uh, what it is that you do and, and what you're all about. Thank you, Farm. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, clinical psychologists have been in practice for a long time and work with primarily men. I do work with women also, but primarily men. And one of the things we deal with, I just put it up is the shame factor for men. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of stuff going on right now about men's mental health. And I tell guys, uh, let's deal with shame. If I talk to five, if I talk to six guys, three of them will tell me they don't have shame. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And shame is the malaise that we feel about ourselves. It could be, it can come out as fear of embarrassment. It can come out as uh, imposter syndrome. But a lot of guys, uh, their mental health, they don't really give up much time where women do because they want to have babies. I think having, when well, you don't want to have a child, there's a part of you, you've got to stay connected. I think with a lot right. of men, we get disconnected. So that's kind of what I thought we'd talk about today. Things that really disconnect us yeah, our best culture. absolutely. Yeah. And thank you for touching on that. And um, I, I guess how long have you been doing your work for? And and uh, and I'm you're based in California, but where? Yeah, exactly? Los Angeles. Yeah, Los Angeles, and uh, living just south of the airport uh, by the beach. Um, have four children and uh, <laughs> four dogs. Don't judge me for that. <laughs> we have a beagle. But I, uh, I find that, uh, before that, in my prior life, I was a policeman for eight years from age 23 to 31. That was an education that I had no idea how valuable it was working with right. people and, uh, went to seminary and got a master's degree in, uh, theology, adult development and realized I really want to work with people more outside of that domain. And I've been mm -hmm. in practice now for 30 years in private practice, uh, in Westlake, which is right over by UCLA in Westwood, California. Very cool. Very cool. Thank you for sharing that. And yeah, I think let's jump right into it. Like shame is uh, obviously yeah. a huge uh, topic and, and, you know, I've covered shame to a certain extent. And the biggest thing is, you know, I've read a lot of work by Brene Brown too. And, you, you know, she, she met points out that shame often thrives on hiding it and not talking about it. Right. And, and for men, that's such a huge issue. Uh, before we were talking offline, I did mention mm -hmm. that, you know, I've 
been doing a lot of research recently and and uh, working on a paper around how shame manifests itself, especially if we've had um, childhood trauma or failures along the way. Um, especially for men, there's an aspect of keeping it a secret, which only perpetuates that cycle further. What's your experience been w- with shame and why is it something that you believe is important to talk about, especially when it comes to men? I, uh, that's a great point, um, Farkham, is that probably 30 years ago, there was an article came out about the same time John Bradshaw's book came out, you know, healing the shame within you. And mm-hmm. this theorist, the psychologist felt that the reason why therapy doesn't work because we're not talking about shame. Right. And I believe shame is its own diagnostic tree is maybe shame, depression, anxiety. But I really believe that shame is the hub. It's kind of like in our deepest secrets, our deepest meanings. And what Brene Brown is, I completely agree with her. Shame cannot tolerate exposure. Mm-hmm. And our greatest secrets many times is the things we're most shame, shameful about. Now, I've had people say, what's, can't shame be useful? We're not talking about that. Like I feel that's more guilt. I feel ashamed mm-hmm. that I yelled at somebody or I, you know, I forgot to pay something, you know, or I was rude to my neighbor. That's more guilt. Shame is the business is like in a marble vase or a pillar. You can see all these grains, different veins running through it. That's shame. It's insidious inside of us. It's not outside. It's not action related. It's feeling related. It's a belief related. Mm-hmm. And you talked about childhood trauma many times. Wrong with kids, my, all of us, is before the age of 10, when something happens at home, it's our fault. Mm-hmm. Before age 10, kids tend to internalize family trauma as their own trauma. You know, that's right. nothing to do with them. Dad loses his job, foreclosure, parents get divorced. On some level, it's the kid's fault. Mm-hmm. And because of that, many times it grows into, if I was good enough, that wouldn't have happened. Right. That's where it all starts. It, and John Bradshaw, Renee Brown, Wayne Dyer, they all talk about it being insidious, meaning it just digs in. It gets into mm-hmm. our, you know, the Catholics may call it sin. Uh, in India, they may call it delusion. But at the end of the day, it disconnects us from ourselves. You know, it's like all roads lead to Rome. Right. And I find, I tell men, if you're going to go to therapy, I get asked, what should I talk about? Talk about shame. Because if you're talking about that, you're going to hit, if you don't hit 100% of it, you'll hit 90. Mm-hmm. And the other 10%, you know, take care of itself. So right. I don't be so, you know, why don't, when, I, when you hear the word shame, what comes to mind? What, like, what would be a working definition for you? Uh, well, when I hear the word shame. Uh, yeah, well, it's fine. I'm, I'm looking for the definition I wrote. <laughs> well, I remember just growing up and being told shame on you, right? So it's like, to me, it was yeah. always like, oh, mm-hmm. uh. It, it was just always this something I've done that's shameful and I need to be like regretful for it. And and then mm. I started identifying with these things about myself, whether it was uh, not performing in school or misbehaving or uh, doing something that wasn't accepted by my parents. So all of those things started becoming shameful. And then I started repressing those parts of myself. And uh, I, mm-hmm. to your point, I started... Uh, disassociating with those parts of myself. And then because they were repressed, they would show up in different ways. And for me, often it showed up as anger as an adult, or Mm -hmm. I I would project those feelings or emotions uh, that I thought were shameful onto other people. Um, And until I didn't really like sit down and and start sifting through all of it, I didn't realize was going on it just kept manifesting itself as different um i, I guess different emotions and and problems no absolutely what you just said uh, i'm gonna hitchhike um shame is a primary emotional wound it's not a secondary belief it's not based on a particular action it's more of a paralyzing emotional psychological state of mind that distorts the view of ourselves in the world and preventing us from developing a loving sense of self and impairing our ability to form safe and secure relationships because of the chronic state of being discovered as a phony fraud or as an imposter. 
Mm. She, it's like you're in it, uh, you know, you're training, you're telling me that, um, an engineer, shame, short circuits are wiring for systematic growth, mm. developmental, like Erickson, go through these different stages. Shame just shorts wi wires it, and we're off balance. The imbalance sets in. Yeah. And, yeah. And, it, and as a young boy, many times we'll say to our parents, I've been guilty, you know, shame on you. That's more of a guilt driven where, but after a while we felt effective. That's where the, um, the road starts, the fork in the road. Right. And many right. men getting, uh, going down later on in life. I see guys in their late teens, they're controlling, they're kind of thugs, bullies. They're harsh on their girlfriends. I'm always thinking who in your life had you feeling defective? Because you're trying to offset that by controlling people, controlling circumstances, and being aggressive. It's all right. coming from the same wound within you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's such an important distinction. And I think... So one of the things I was curious about, because men repress their emotions and they struggle with expressing their emotions, whereas women are more comfortable talking about their emotions... I believe shame shows up differently for men and women, but uh, how how is it that women react to shame and men react to shame differently based on your experience? I just wanted to throw that out there. It's interesting. I think women struggle with shame as much as men do, but it it's different. Mm -hmm. Women tend to internalize it. Men externalize it. Yeah. I mean, in in North America, I know, sure, up in Canada, the United States, I think if it's not 100% mass murderers are men, then it's 99.9. <laughs> there might have been one woman that took a gun someplace, but men externalize their rage. Women internalize it. Anorexia, eating disorders, uh, depression, just many different. It's more internal, self-loathing, right. self-hatred, where men will offset that. And it, everyone in these mass shootings, uh, mental health issues, men who feel disenfranchised from their coworkers, from people. Women don't do that. They just, they take it as that they're bad. Men say, well, I'm bad, but I'm going to make, I'm going to take it out on you. Mm. Two big, very big distinctions. Very different. Right. Right. And it's all coming from the same place. It's same, exactly same, place. same source. Like you said. Yeah. And women t internalize it, men externalize And that is, uh, research bears that to be unfortunately very true. Right. Right. And, and so, you know, we touched on shame and, and I appreciate you kind of giving that definition as well, but you know, we were also talking about offline, like what are some of the ways that shame is maintained in our lives? And, and some of the ways I've felt I've done that is, you know, whether it's perfectionism, uh, mm -hmm. avoidance, uh, just keeping myself busy so I don't have to face those things that I'm hiding or running from. Um, but what are some of the other ways that you've seen, um, or at least you've highlighted in your book around how people maintain shame? Joe, you know, I talk, uh, what I've seen, I call them seven uh, emotional sites. It's like a computer program starts running, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the seven are, is the fear of embarrassment. And that's, you know, I'll, I'll run through the fear of embarrassment. Number two is anger. And many times feeling invisible. A big one many people talk about is the imposter syndrome. And we'll get to that. And number four is feeling isolated, fear of rejection. Uh, number five, many times you see with the men, very suspicious, untrusting of authority. Uh, number six, fear of intimacy. And that's for a lot of guys that may have reckless sex, one night mm -hmm. stands. There's no intimacy there. And number seven is the fear of criticism that you're going to be judged. You can't tolerate feedback. Any one of those seven can set off like a match, a uh, whole shame reaction, shame cycle. Mm -hmm. And I find that uh, when you, what I find very common is anger, feeling invisible. Like guys like, well, he, he disrespected me. Okay, what does that mean? Disrespect. <laughs> I always think like, dude, what are you talking about? Right. You know, Cause he didn't say hello to you. Cause that comes from, I'm not enough. Right. You know? Like, you know, you're in line, I'm at the, you know, at the market or something. And my son will say, that guy disrespected us. Like, what are you, what are you 
I, I didn't even <laughs> like he didn't he didn't he's pre- who knows maybe he's having a bad day you know Listen. but that's how it starts that anger comes right. out so many different right i find part the two big ones for men is the explosiveness and you go from there all of a sudden you said perfectionism mm. it all comes from a sense of shame because perfectionism is i'm not good enough right and if i'm good enough then i'll feel good and it may last momentarily but it doesn't pay the bill you know yeah I always yep. tell guys you can't outsource your healing you can't outsource right. it you, you got to do it yourself you know yeah and it to me it's almost like a hamster wheel right like you're constantly just running around in circles like perfectionism yes. for example right you're never going to okay. get it and then it's just going to continue to perpetuate itself right and see and that breeds the rage yeah you know, obsessive compulsive personalities i find many times are shame driven personalities because they don't, if I keep everything straight, then I won't feel anything. Right. I mean, I've, I've got a guy in his 60s, very obsessive, but he's never dealt with the abuse from his mother. Hmm. But if he controls everything, he doesn't feel anything. Very right. common with men. Very hmm. common. And the imposter syndrome is, I'm, I'm way beyond my pay grade, metaphorically. You know, like right. they're going to find out I'm not good enough. And that could be, I, I think a lot of guys, I said this to the, the show of dad, David Mendez, that I find a lot of da- men, it's not they don't want to be fathers. They don't think they're good enough. Hmm. So they abdicate the role. I'm not saying, I'm not making any excuses for guys not following through. I find a lot right. of men come to see me. They don't believe they're good enough. It sounds odd. But like, they defer to their wife or, you know, the baby mama, and they just kind of almost wash their hands, not because of irresponsibility, lack of response. Right. It's for a lack. It's more because they feel so shame driven. Mm. Like, I don't want to mess up my kid. So I'm not going to get involved. I'm like, okay, no, that's, we're going the wrong way. The best way to heal shame is exposure. Right. Shame cannot tolerate exposure. Absolutely. You know, yeah. you know, the, the old analogy, I'll stop here, but is, you know, shame is like that monster in the closet. You are convinced. Next morning, you open up the closet, you turn the light on. It is a rubber yellow raincoat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was a monster. No, it's, it's a freaking rubber, ready made, <laughs> rubber made uh, raincoat. But in the dark, it looks ominous. And that's what shame right. is. In the dark, it's ominous. Right. And I think that's such an important distinction. And it, it almost, you know, when we look at people do that, when they run away from their responsibilities, we're quick to sh- judge them and, yep. and shame them for that mm-hmm. as well. But once you start recognizing that, you know, they're coming from a place of scarcity and not feeling yes. good enough, or maybe, it's almost hard not to have compassion and empathy. But the other piece is, I think, with imposter syndrome, it's not only career related or, or work related, but you often see that in relationships too, where men, oh, you know, if they're in a relationship yes. that's going well, they'll immediately mm-hmm. feel like, oh, um, this is pro- too good to be true, or yep. she's going to leave me. She's going to figure out that I'm, I'm, I'm like not I'm worthy. Yeah. Yeah. So I get to, that fear of intimacy, hands down. And, you know, and under those are like the numerator events, but the, denominator is shame and from it i'm i know you know this when i see guys really raging i'm always thinking i wonder what his dad was like i know it sounds mm-hmm. weird you know i saw a guy uh you know it's been you know this time of year you know at the supermarket before thanksgiving and this guy was in line and just laying into this clerk and this guy you know he's a retired guy he's working you know um his name is Hal, and in this younger man, probably in his early 30s, is just laying into him, but he made a mistake and didn't get his turkey, whole thing. And I said to him, I, I couldn't help it. I looked at him, I go, the guy's looking at me like, where are you looking at me? I go, he didn't mean to do that. Yeah. He didn't do, he didn't do that to you. The guy's like, take him back. I go, he didn't do that. Hal, right. that was not, he didn't do that to you. That was not on purpose. Oh. You can just feel the wind just, 
he was conv- it was purposeful it was done on purpose and this poor guy he's just working there you know he's you know just trying to make a good living but that's rage. that's rage and that rage comes from sh- not fi- like it's a, we miss we distort events as if they're we're doing them right right as if they're being done to us i'm gonna go back right. to intimacy that is number two i see guys blow up more relationships or become abusive verbally. Mm. Physical is shame. That's like you're going way up the scale. Because after right. the physical abuse comes violence. Not that physical isn't violence. When I say violence, I'm talking gun violence. I'm talking like fatal. Right. Mm-hmm. That rage. So it all escalates. Like got the supermarket, maybe a three and four, gets home, yells at his partner, five or six, then has road rage. Now we're at a 10. Yeah. And that's all, you know, Thursday afternoon. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> For sure. For sure. Hasn't even snowed yet. <laughs> yeah. Know. When I think part of it is, I mean, to your point, there's that aspect uh, of unhealed wounds that we haven't mm. dealt with that we project onto other people and, and we personalize. But I think there's also, and, and I'm just kind of thinking out loud here, but there's probably yeah. an aspect of, Things that we don't like about ourselves, and then when we see it in others, it's mm. easier for us to get angry with others about those things and judge them because yes. we're too afraid to to look at it ourselves in the mirror and and heal that part, right? And I think absolutely that also comes from shame as well. Right on, Joe. You know that project you just self loathing is shame based. Raging, self-loathing, and the fear of intimacy are all shame-driven behaviors. Shame is fueling those. Uh, and the self-loathing is, if she gets close enough to me, I'm not going to like me. Mm-hmm. You know. And when we see those qualities in someone else, we, we may be very critical of them. But you know, in Eastern psychology, they say if we're triggered by somebody, that's our issue. Yeah, there's our blind. That's our blind spot, and it's never not been true. I know it's poor grammar, but I, Carl Jung, that's one of his major premises. Right. If you, as men, if we're triggered at that guy at work, or at school, our neighbor, I'm like, oh, okay, I don't like that of me. Right. I tell that to guys. Yep. You know, it's yeah, you. and I mean, oh, yeah, and the, it's brutal, for sure. And I think the Stoic philosophy talks about that too. I mean, I've mm-hmm. you know read meditations by Marcus Aurelius and. He mm-hmm. touches on that too, right? The second you're angered, that's become your, your problem. It has nothing to do with the do other with person. And, Absolutely. And yeah. I mean, it takes a lot of time and work to figure that out. But I think once you do, you're able to navigate through life in a much different way. At least that's been my experience. Um, you know, it, absolutely. People ask me, why do you talk about shame? Because at the end of the day, we, we want peace. Mm-hmm. inner peace with meditation and part of our journey life journey is clearing these logs off the road and right. meditation helps us being mindful conscious helps us to not to react but start to respond right like the guy the other day reacting to that he didn't get his turkey sale or you know they didn't have the right one i don't know what he was reacting to but it was intense I kept thinking, this is not going the right direction. Right. Well, but then if you take a step back and you kind of, again, practice that compassion and empathy. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm not and I'm not saying this to excuse people's behavior, but I'm just maybe mm-hmm. thinking about this person you're, you know, you're using as an example. For him, it's probably like if he shows home, up at home with, you know, mm-hmm. without the turkey or if it's not proper, you know, he's probably worried that his wife's going to think he's, again, not good enough. Right. Yeah. And, and right. You know, you know that the mm-hmm. simple time. Absolutely. And that's what it gets back to. And w- part of our that we always tell what's your inner narrative? Mm-hmm. And, and shame takes it to you're not good enough. I don't care where you start the narrative, you end up at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, seven right. miles down. It is a tough walk up. Sure. But that's where it takes you. That inner narrative, you know, whatever it is, on some other. If I was good enough, that wouldn't be happening. Mm-hmm. No, no, it's just a speed bump. Right. It's a speed bump. 
you know, right. it's the the saying. It's not so much what happens to you; it's how you react to what's happening. And shame distorts your ability to react. Right. You know, in sports, it, the analogy would be your 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 hamstrings don't work right. You just can't respond the way you would like to. Mm. And the game of life is out of balance for you. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I agree with you. Joe, another thing I want to get into with shame is a lot of women are saying their husbands, their boyfriends, or fiancés, you, you got to do something with your anger. You got to mm-hmm. do something with your mood swings. You know, I, I, I had a guy come in yesterday, says to me, I don't believe, I don't believe in therapy. I go, well, I didn't know you needed to believe in therapy. <laughs> I, I, I didn't know it was a belief system. I go, do you believe in get, feeling better? Yeah. Do you believe in working out? Yeah. Do you believe, you know, making the most of your life? Yeah. That's therapy. Oh, and literally like, oh, it's not one flu with a cuckoo's and it has like, you know, that's a whole nother, I mean, God bless those people. They need that. But we're talking mainstream guys. Therapy is your emotional, your physical, your relational, your spiritual. It's the whole pie chart. Right. You know? Yeah, no. And, and it's, it's funny you mentioned that because uh, I've had recent conversations with people too around therapy and it's, 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 you know, therapy, I think also triggers people because again, it's how you frame it in your mind right. and what your subjective experience is with therapy. But a lot of people associate it with, with failure. And then, and I did at least, uh, you know, mm-hmm. a decade ago, I looked at therapy as, as a form of failure that you've accepted failure. And now you're going to seek help. Um, and, and then mm-hmm. that also elicits shame because right on. why yeah. else would you need to go get help? You know, it's interesting. What got me into therapy, you know, you have your comfort zones right here. But when your despair exceeds this, exceeds this level, is when men go get help. Right. You know, as uh, my urologist buddy says to me, men come to the doctor for two reasons. A broken arm or their penis doesn't work. I go, Dr. Mills, I can't really argue with that. You go, seriously, I show up in my office, either they got a limb hanging off, or they have erectile dysfunction. That's when I see them. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And you should have come so in I, 10 miles earlier, but men are that way with emotions. Like, I know you know, know that, but a lot of guys, they go to therapy when they get the Dear John note from their wife or their girlfriend or their fiance. Mm-hmm. Says, I'm done. I'm, I'm out of here. It's amazing how they make time to get to, into your office and start, you know, deep. Re- what the hell happened? What the heck happened? Right. That's what we want to get out of the cry and shame will postpone your healing for as long as you allow it. Right. Yeah. You could yeah. buy into that for a lifetime, many lifetimes, but eventually you got to pay the bill for and sure. confront it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with you. And I guess to kind of shift gears a little bit, mm-hmm. I know we wanted to touch on how shame and, and like the whole masculine traits, like, you know, obviously there's a huge issue around what's masculinity and everyone's got their own yeah. definition. There's people out there who are preaching about masculinity uh, and different forms. There's conflicting ideas out there, but you know, we were talking offline and I think a lot yeah. of it is driven by shame, mm-hmm. but how are you seeing that showing up uh, in kind of men right now in, in today's world? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Harvey, Cause I noticed with, I'm working on a book called New Masculinity, a guidebook to men's mental health. Mm-hmm. Is masculinity, there's four corners to a building. Healthy masculinity starts with um, compassion, empathy, mm-hmm. a life plan, and believing something bigger than yourself. Compassion is your ability to think of others. Empathy is that you have the ability to feel what you're feeling. You put those two ingredients in, you have a plan for your life because you know what you want to do. And you also believe in something bigger than yourself. But those two elements, passion and empathy, there won't be a Jeffrey Epstein. You can't exploit women or others. Because if you like yourself, you're going to like others. That starts with empathy. Because Matt, I find a lot of men get into, I call it body masculinity or narcissistic masculinity in those two elements have never developed in them, empathy or compassion. 
because narcissistic men are lacking empathy for themselves and others. Mm -hmm. It's all on a scale. I'm talking about where it's uh, a relationship problem where right. it's used, you know, to demean, but all the movements and women in rage with men, because those two elements are not in place. Empathy right. and, and, and compassion. And compassion is strength. You know, right. being humble is a courageous move. Being arrogant is easy. Humility <laughs> takes strength. <laughs> Seriously, that's compassion. And empathy, the ability to like yourself, self-acceptance changes the world. Right. Dads teach their boys how to have self-acceptance. They're not taking guns to Walmart. Right. They're not taking, or, or to school, you know. And there's a, to your point, those two elements Every man has to deal with those two. Mm -hmm. Guys say, I don't want my life plan is, well, let's talk about, do you like yourself? And look at me like, like a lunatic. No, do you like yourself? Do, how can you feel like you have a purpose if you don't like yourself? Right. I'm, I'm not talking arrogance, but like, it's okay to be you. You accept the whole, the, the, the weaknesses and the strengths. Because our greatest strength is our ability to admit our weaknesses. Mm -hmm. That is our greatest strength as men. That's our bond. Right. Our bonds are weaknesses, not our strengths. Mm -hmm. Like you yes. and I have developed this relationship. That's what men need. They can talk to a guy. Right. Yeah. And every guy needs one or two men in his life that really know him. Because that builds compassion and empathy. Yeah. Yeah. And then what? And I think to build on that, I've talked about men's groups where, you know, you mm -hmm. can kind of sitting around and establishing that brotherhood. Because for most most of the time, you know, men will hang out with guys they play sports with or go to the bar mm -hmm. with. Your point, you know, that's very superficial. Uh, so, so you may think you've got a group of men uh, around you, but they probably don't know the real you, the vulnerable right. you. And, um, and you're yes. probably not demonstrating aspects of compassion and empathy around them. But that's so crucial that you bring that up. Because quite often, I guess to explore on that further, when that's not present, how is it being, how, how are men showing up when they're not tapping into their compassion and empathy? And I know you mentioned on uh, around the whole narcissist tendencies, but also there's this aspect of, well, how can I look like a strong person? Right. right. And that feeds into competition. Men are brutal right. with competition. You know, I talk, it could be about money. You know, I know that I talk about the wealth masculinity. Yeah. Because you have a lot of wealth, therefore you're, your masculinity is in check. Right. It, it's, they're absolutely in, um, and they're not related. <laughs> One doesn't relate to the other, you know? Right. Because, I, because wealth many times is a, a bravado, you know, because men that are superficial outside themselves are seeking two things, power and status. Mm -hmm. And we know that through the ages. Right. Power and status are, you know, vacuous. But with compassion and empathy, you can have those two, but they're balanced. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm not saying that those two are, they're not evil at all, but out of balance, they're problematic. Right. You yeah. Know? And it can all show up as tyranny, right? If you don't right. have that power yeah. and status checked, and if it's not well balanced, to your point, it, you, you become a tyrant. Tyrant. You know, I don't know. Another thing you mentioned, like, you know, football season, baseball season, it's great to have guys you bond with. No argument. And but you've got to have a couple guys in your life that you, you go below the waterline. Right. They know, metaphorically, always say, they know where the dead bodies are buried. You know, they know your secrets in a good way. Yeah. You know what you're struggling with, or maybe you're watching too much porn, you tell them about it. Okay. Right. Or you've been gambling too much and you, you want to, you need some accountability, or you've been drinking too much. Yeah. Or you want to lose 10 pounds. This is what the, the brotherhood's about. Right. And sports is a good start because, I mean, you know, we, let's say we all like, you know, the NFL or hockey. That's a good start. Right. But it can't stop there. There's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with the third party activity. But taking it a little bit deeper, that's what changes men. Right. And guys, like yourself, you know, when you have a good connection with a couple of your buddies, what a breath of fresh air. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's, so it's, it's, it's incredible. Oh, it's so valuable because I think. Once you can trust another man uh, or, or you, know, oh. you have that brotherhood, you're able to even seek out advice mm -hmm. 
um, because quite often we have our own blind spots, right? And um, well, that's a big point. Can, yeah, can we, we'll come back to that. Let's bookmark blind spots. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. your buddy, because your, your buddy may see everyone's. I've got them. We all have them. Yeah, your buddy, because you know he's got your back, and maybe a childhood friend, maybe a colleague you met. Mm-hmm. But they're in. I there's these groups, a weekend warrior groups for men. I I have no judgment. I love them. I think it's great, but they're spending fifteen thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars for a weekend to get that bond but the problem is you can do it in a weekend but it takes time you've got to really make a commitment to the compassion and empathy part of your life right and it has nothing to do with your career you know i got guys that are plumbers i got guys who are surgeons they get these two things going everything goes better right their right. kids like them better <laughs> their partners their family grandparents you're, you're calmer you're more effective. You're yeah, and I think effective. part part of that competition also for men, I believe, oh. often from a place of scarcity, right? And 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 to your point earlier, mm. men want to establish this dominance hierarchy, um, but I think a lot of it is from a place of scarcity because they don't have yeah. more love for themselves or to yes, point, they probably don't like themselves. Yeah, I, I tell you. Uh, in the East, Eastern spirituality, they view, or Eastern psychology, competition as a character flaw, mm. as a liability. You know, they adult, they put on the same law as addiction. This whole right. thing, you got to beat somebody. That's not the way of, you know, of the, a warrior. I mean, a warrior doesn't have to beat anybody. He leads people. doesn't beat right. You yeah. know, and a couple of my buddies, I used to have season tickets with them to, uh, college of college football team out here in los angeles and he calls me up a number of years goes hey steve i can't i can't participate anymore i'm like what (laughs) what are you talking about we go to the games he goes i can't endorse beating other people Hmm. i'm like oh barry because i knew eventually i'd have to join him in that (laughs) because i knew it's like i can't turn you know you can't unsee that all right right but competition Again, in balance, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, I may, I may be competitive with some jogging, not to beat them, but to make myself better. Right. That's where it could be helpful, mm-hmm. right? But it's when I'm doing it to put that other guy down. Now we got a problem. Right. I know people. I know a lot of guys say to me, "Okay, don't go, you know, don't go rainbows and unicorns on me." I mean, like, don't become. No, that that takes courage. Right. To, encourage other men that's what builds men when a guy you have a buddy i have a buddy that we feel wants our best we'll we'll go to hell and back to support them right how's that competition no it's it's everything the opposite of competition which support right Right. and empowerment right yeah absolutely and i mean you know what i appreciate about for people that don't watch nhl or the ice hockey here yeah north america uh, at the end of the playoff series, the players line up and shake each other's hands. Like, you know, you put yeah. it all on, right? you compete with each other, but at the end of the day, you still have that mutual Brotherhood. respect. Yeah. And you mm-hmm. admire each other for the effort you put in, but you know, you're not leaving the game saying, Oh, I, mm-hmm. I, I'm better than him. It's like, no, right. You beat me today, tomorrow I'll get to beat you, but we'll have yeah. this respect for each other. Right. And you know, I think that's the competition. I can't say enough. I, there, my wife and I went to the USC UCLA game last week, big college mm-hmm. football game and huge rivalry. And I literally wore neutral colors. <laughs> I didn't wear this. Okay. <laughs> I literally wore a black sweatshirt, you know, cause it was cold. Cause I told my wife, I just want to go watch the game. I don't want to get in an argument with the other side. Right. And this one woman, her team was losing and she started. I'll just say, <laughs> she called my wife the C word. Oh, wow. And I went, oh. I just went and I'm like, okay, we just got to go. When, like, we're, and, and walking away, my wife goes, she doesn't like herself. I go, no, you don't do that when you feel good about yourself. Yeah, you're mm-hmm. disappointed. You want your team to win. But 
in Los Angeles, there's been these horrible murders, like at a Dodger game. I mean, when I talk about murder, I mean, like, someone beat almost to their death because they're a Giants fan. Mm. And I go, guys, that's when the shame is out of control. Right. There's so much despair inside of you that you're, if your team doesn't win, you're awful. Right. You know, to your point, I don't mean to get on a tangent, but I love hockey. And I love when the guys line up, shake hands, give each other a hug after the game. Yeah. See, that's yeah. the brotherhood. Absolutely. Yeah. Not, and and that after the SC game, the guys all, you know, congregated in the middle of the field, shaking hands. The fans aren't. There's mm-hmm. fights in the parking lot and knuckleheads. And this woman's calling my wife to see word. I'm like, I look at my wife and we just got to go. Like, we got to get yeah, out of yeah. here. You know, my, my, cause she had never seen anything like that. She was, I can't believe people do this because she wasn't raised around sports. She was in, from you know England. And I go, no, I go, it's just, I can't believe it. Yeah. Yeah. So to your like- point, men who like themselves, mentors, cause there's always someone, there's a young man around, regardless of age who wants three things. Every man wants, every guy need wants feel accepted. Except is, I like you, but number two, understood. Mm-hmm. When you feel understood by your buddy, I mean, it's walking downhill. Right. And number three, uh, love. And love is, I'm going to hang with you. You don't need yeah. to be perfect. Right. Those yeah. are the big three. Well, and I think that's kind of the whole idea of connection um, mm-hmm. that Renee talks about too, right? Mm-hmm. Feel seen valued and heard right yep and, and and that's all we all want as humans right is that human connection connection and see and what i love what Brene Brown. she's reaching an audience that you and i aren't going to reach and we want to get yeah. to guys you know and i love that she does and when wayne dyer and john bratch shame is a corrosive it breaks the connection mm-hmm. it, it's rust the connection gets it's not as solid yeah. and dealing with our shame like god why do i get so mad when my team loses mm-hmm. like, because on some level i'm not enough right i always tell guys like your team lost the super bowl why did you get so mad you know what, in america that is the number one day for domestic violence super bowl sunday the number one day wow and when i was a police officer years ago Super Bowl Sunday was busier than New Year's Eve. Wow. In terms of calls, fights, yeah. shootings, because your team didn't win. Mm-hmm. Invariably, the demand wasn't because your team won. We didn't go to those houses. Went to the houses where your team lost. Yeah. Yeah. Terrible. And so many women hold their breath when their husband's team loses. Whether it be NASCAR, hockey, or right, World Cup soccer right now. Yeah. Your country didn't win. There's a lot. You know, I, I, I tell my client, if you're going to a bar to watch a game, you better make sure you're with the same group of people, you know, whether you're rooting for England, Canada, or, you know, I wouldn't go mix it up. Right. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's interesting uh, how people respond with sports. And I think so much of a, you know, I, I mean, I used to be a diehard fan for oh. hockey. I've taken a kind of a step back for, <laughs> for personal reasons. But yes. yeah, I think a lot of our identity is is associated with these teams. And uh, it's very interesting because I, I think part of it is, again, we're seeking connection. And by having yes. our identity tied up with this team, it, we connect with other fans or or it's almost like we worship this team, but it's probably better extending that worship elsewhere right so right um, on something That's i'm trying great. to think about. <laughs> just hard like i love what you just said right it is connection like i have some buddies who are diehard dodger fans mm-hmm. and we'll text each other and lament that our coach made a bad call uh or something but it gets us talking mm-hmm. it gets us talking oh, so how's your cancer treatment it gets us talking i right. tell guys let's sports that's a great introduction. You know, that's like walking through the front door. But once you're inside the house, let's start talk, talk. 
15. Mm-hmm. You're like, what are you doing with your health? I got a buddy, he's getting his PhD. How's that coming? Right. You know, because he wants to teach. But we'll talk about Dodger baseball first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just the- talk, yeah, talk smack. But it war- but guys, that's okay. It's a great warm up. Right. You know? Right. It's a great and that's what you said about her. Like you and I talking, I love the connection. Mm-hmm. I feel empowered. Yeah. 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 No, thank you for that. Um, and I'm just being mindful of time here as we come to yes. an end. But I, I do I know we've been going all over, but <laughs> thank you. No, no, this was great. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time and coming on My here pleasure. and sharing your experience with us and your wisdom. Uh, but for listeners that do want to get a hold of you, what are some ways can they uh, they can do that? Uh, Stephen uh, Poulter dot com or the Shame Factor. The Shame Factor. I have a website. I'm in Los Angeles. I do glad to talk to people on the phone, like what we're doing. Um, I'm, I'm accessible. You can you can find me. Yeah, no, and, and I'll put all that in the show notes. Yeah, yeah. and when it comes up, uh, I'll put the, the show on my website. And you know, last I just want to leave guys with this or wives that are listening to this. If your husband or boyfriend's struggling, and you don't know what to do, focus on understanding them. Mm. Just focus on trying to understand them. Now, it may take time, but it'll help unravel the seemingly impossible mess. But that's what I do when I work with guys. I try to understand them. And they feel, they, when someone feels understood, a lot of things open up. Right. It saves marriages, children. So many good things come out of that. You know, that's why I, wives, you got your husband, your boyfriend, he's struggling. Rather than tell him what to do, which doesn't go well for anybody, if, you un- if they feel understood, they're going to hear you. Mm-hmm. When you feel understood, you can take a lot of good stuff in. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. The wall's lower. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah, wall's and, <laughs> yeah, and I think it goes both ways. I think for men, too, like, mm. just put, put what you need on the table because um, yeah. you can't expect the other person to figure it out or, or, or read your no. mind, right? Right. Well, that's a big one. In relation, mind reading, like, that's like, I put that up with adultery. I mean, I, you know, uh, infidelity, mind reading, infidelity, like on the same parallel, because yeah. both of them lead to um, a crisis. Yep. Yeah. But thank no. you so much. My pleasure to be with you. And I appreciate what you're doing for us in the brotherhood out here. No, I appreciate that very much. So thank you again. Um, and I'm sure we'll be talking more in the future. All right. All right. Take care. All right. Thank you for checking out this episode with Dr. Stephen Poulter. This was the last episode of 2022. Thank you for tuning in all year long. The next episode will be next week, which will be the first one for 2023. Please subscribe to the podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts. And always feel free to leave a comment. I always love hearing from you. Thank you.